Our service today, including the sermon and the prayers, was recorded before the sad announcement on Friday morning of the death of His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Consequently, I wanted us to pause for a moment before the service to give thanks for Prince Philip's life and to pray for our Queen Elizabeth in her loss. The Queen is known to be a godly Christian believer and so we pray that she will know the comfort of the God of all comfort at this sad and difficult time. We're going to be quiet for a moment before we pray together. Firstly, a prayer written for us at this time. God of our lives, we give thanks for the life of Prince Philip, for his love of our country and for his devotion to duty. We entrust him now to your love and mercy through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now a prayer for our Queen. Our gracious and loving Father, we lift to you today Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in her grief and sadness. Thank you that she is your child, that she knows you and trusts you. We pray that in her private moments as a grieving widow, she would know your comfort surrounding her. And in those more public moments as queen of this nation, she would experience your strength enabling her. May she and her family look to Jesus at this time for the peace which only you can bring. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Our service will follow in just a few moments' time. service today. Whoever you are and wherever you are in the world, you are very welcome indeed. Last weekend we celebrated the greatest act of love ever, the greatest rescue ever, when Jesus died for our sins and rose again to give us new life. John, in his first letter, tells us this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And last Sunday, we all celebrated that amazing news. About 200 members of St. Bart's were able to meet and sing together outdoors 
in three services at King Edward Road and at Hayesfield School. We missed very much those who weren't able to join us. But here's just a flavour of those services. seated where Jesus' body had been, at, one at the head and the other. Okay, well, you may well have shared some of your uh, most embarrassing... They have taken my Lord away. So please be seated, of course, if you do need to sit and sit. It was great to celebrate Easter Day, whether we were able to be at those services or were celebrating at home. But every day is Easter Day because Jesus is risen and he is alive today. Let's pray using the church's special prayer for today. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth. Through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. We're going to sing together all praise to him whose love is seen in Christ the Son, the Servant King. And the first verse goes on like this. All praise to him who humbly came to bear our sorrow, sin and shame, who lived to die, who died to rise, the all-sufficient sacrifice.
praise to him whose power imparts the love of God within our hearts. So often we speak and sing words with our lips, but don't live them in our lives. And yet Jesus came so that we could be forgiven. But he came also to change us and enable us to be like him. However, we first need to acknowledge the ways in which we still fail to live God's ways in order that we too might be transformed by him. So let's pray together. I'm going to read some words of Jesus that will appear on the screen and then we'll pause as we individually acknowledge that we've not lived as we should have lived. And then we'll pray together using words that will then appear on the screen. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. And we pray together. Lord, we have sinned. We have not followed your law. We have not kept your commandments. We have not sought for you with all our heart. We have not walked in your ways. We have not fully obeyed you. Lord, we long to be faithful and obedient. Do not put us to shame. Give us upright hearts. Teach us obedience and never forsake us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. This week we're going to begin a new series of sermons from Matthew's Gospel looking at the authority of Jesus and its impact on our lives. If you're looking after young children, you may want to pause the service at the beginning of the reading from Matthew 8, and then return later when you can concentrate on the sermon without distractions. But now, let's go and see what Bev has been learning about God this week. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Sunday the 11th, and it's glorious weather here. Um, but uh, it may not be on Sunday the 11th, but uh, it will return because the Earth is literally getting closer to the sun as it rotates uh, through the season. So um, let me show you this. Uh, this is my new raised bed that I made. Um, I, I really chuff with it, uh, and we'll see. Um, so here I have planted some peas to grow up in here, uh, and some radish. And then when my courgettes and squash are ready, I'll plant them out in here, and I may even make another one. Well. Uh, something else that I've been planting, uh, I've been planting here, here are my sage plants, sage. Well, let me turn you over, we'll see Calvin on the way, to uh, what sage is. Oh, let me unhook this, there we go, make it straight. So let's, uh, here's Calvin having a wash, interesting. Hello Calv, hello boyo. Hello. Right. So we've got my sage. Another thing. Here we are. Now, what is sage? What is sage? Um, well, yes, it's a little plant. It's also a herb. A herb that we use uh, on our food to make it taste nicer. Uh, we also have uh, basil. Here it's in its dried form. Uh, difficult to grow because it needs lots and lots of sun. We have oregano, you can see that's my favourite because uh, there's not much left in there. Um, so those are things that we can grow. We also have other things like tomato ketchup. Do you like tomato ketchup? Um, we have garlic and herb. Mm, garlic and herb mayonnaise. You can probably tell I like a bit too much of that. Um, and we have black peppercorns and salt. Now, why do we put these on our food? We put them on because it tastes nicer. Because it tastes nicer. And watch, actually, salt is pretty special. 
Although it's harmful in lots, it's bad for you in lots and lots of food. Just like when you put too much salt on your chips. But when you put just the right amount in, it tastes really nice and it brings out the flavour. It brings out the flavour of all the food. So these ones just add different flavours, but salt brings out the flavour of the food. Now, the Bible says that when we are to talk to one another, we are to let our conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Well, how do we, converse, how do we make our, our conversation seasoned with salt? Do we just do a, a bit of a salt bay every time we have a conversation? Because that would be weird. Uh, no. What it means is that um, bring out the flavour of the gospel. So when you're talking to people about Jesus, tell people how wonderful he is. Tell people what he means to you. Tell people why, why he is so special. We've just had Easter. Tell people why it means so much to you that Jesus is risen. Um, because that will bring out the flavour of the gospel. It will bring it all and it'll be really wonderful. So let's say God's word says together. God's word says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Well, we're going to sing a song. And it's a brilliant song. It's one we learned at Holiday Bible Club online. It's called The Hero. And it's a brilliant, brilliant song about Jesus. Let's sing. Just 
He's the son of God, and you know his name. For well, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, O oh Lord. I praise you. The Life Project charity was founded because a number of families came together to ensure that there was an inclusive Christian community for adults with learning disabilities. Now, 10 years on, we have seven trustees, we employ eight members of staff, we have 20 volunteers and reach over 50 families in the Bath area. At The Life Project, we offer a range of activities for adults with a learning disability. We offer inclusive worship, meaningful occupation, a parent and carer group, and also a junior group for primary age children. As The Life Project, we really want to see more people with learning disabilities and their families taking up their full part in our church families. Not just because we want to be welcoming, but also because actually we are incomplete if there's anyone missing. Our experience is that if we think creatively and welcome with warm hearts, then we are all enriched when we embrace people with learning disabilities and their families into our churches. It's so important for all of us to have a sense of purpose in life and a structure to our week. And we love to offer that through our barn activities. At the moment, we have a group of 12 young adults with learning disabilities who over three days a week come along and join in at the beginning of the day, our allotment sessions, before we move on to the Old Acorn Barn in Englishcombe Village. There we offer lots of different creative things to do, which include cooking and art and music, and we love making things to sell. Springs is our fellowship group for adults with learning disabilities who live in the Bath area. And every fortnight, between 20 to 30 of us meet together to connect not only with one another, but with God through worship, seeing what the Bible has to say, and through prayer. Springs to me means uh, family and being a part of God's community where we share our stories together. I have met so many good friends in this group. God has really turned my life around for the best. God is my rock and my, and my star. One young woman who joined recently struggles a little bit with words sometimes, but when we asked her, what does God mean to you? She looked over to the musicians who just finished leading worship. She pointed at them, then she pointed up at God, and then she pointed at her heart. And that said it all. Time and time again, we've learned how God transcends the limits that we see, the limits of communication or intellect. And we know that everyone is capable of experiencing something of God's love and his wonder. We all know that when finances and resources are scarce, those that suffer the most are the most vulnerable. We want to be able to carry on and increase all the work we're doing with adults with learning disability in a Christian community in the Bath area. To do that, we need your help. Due to the very competitive nature of grant funding, we rely heavily on our own fundraising. To help us increase our regular income, we are asking today, could you consider giving regularly to The Life Project? Now more than ever, people with learning disability need our help. 
If you feel you would like to give monthly to help us reach out to this vulnerable group in our city, please go to our website and follow the link to our giving page. Thank you. We're now going to pray for the Life Project. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the mission of the Life Project in Bath to develop an inclusive community for those individuals living with learning disabilities and also to serve their families. Lord, we pray in particular for a number of challenges that the Life Project faces in the oncoming months. Lord, we hold up to you Rich Lobb Blake, the new Chief Executive of the Life Project. Lord, we pray that you be with him as he transitions into the Life Project during May and as he takes on his full set of responsibilities in the beginning of June. Lord, we also hold up to you Sue Snell, the Operations Director. Lord, we thank you for the way in which she has served the Life Project. Lord, we pray that you be with her as she finishes that role and retires um, this month. Lord, we hold up to you and pray for the Life Project community as a whole. Lord, we know that change and transition can be unsettling, but Lord, we pray that you be uh, with the community during this time. And Lord, we thank you for the video that we've just watched, and we pray that it would have a profound impact on those who watch it, including ourselves, as we understand the work of the Life Project and how much it means to everyone that the Life Project supports. Lord, we pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen. We are now going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy and then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as testimony to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the, of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. When Jesus came into Peter's house and he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever, he touched her hand and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came and many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our disease, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is it that makes the Christian life so hard? Is it sin? Is it temptation? Is it persecution? All of these things make the Christian life hard. But for me, there's something else, something deeper, more fundamental, which makes all of these things and others so hard to deal with. For me, what makes living a consistent and fruitful Christian life so hard is forgetfulness, spiritual amnesia. Actually living the Christian life is hard because I forget so many of the things that I know to be true. I wonder if you can relate to this. We know things with our heads, but we forget them when we need them. We listen to a sermon. We agree with everything the preacher says. We go home and our problems are just the same, just as difficult to deal with. Why? Because when it comes to actually living our lives, we've already forgotten the truths we know. And more than anything else, what we forget what we know in our heads, but when it comes to living our lives, we forget are these four things. Who Jesus is, who he has come for, what he has come to do for them, and how they can get what he has come to do for them. Perhaps you're listening to this and you've never heard these truths before. Or if you have, you've not yet accepted them as true. If so, I hope you'll find it helpful hearing these things today and reflecting on them. Why not get in touch with a Christian friend and talk through each one? But if we have heard them before and accepted them as true, we need to hear them just as much. Because the antidote to forgetfulness is remembering. And here in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 17, Matthew helps us to remember these four things. First of all, who Jesus is. The very first words Jesus uttered in his public ministry were these. Repent 
for the kingdom of heaven is near. Well, here in chapters eight and nine, we're about to see two things. We will see the kingdom of heaven come near, breaking into the kingdom of this world, waging war with the brokenness and pain of this world. And we will see the king in his kingdom, ruling with power and authority, bringing with him life and wholeness. Jesus heals a man with incurable leprosy instantaneously, with just a touch. He heals a centurion's paralysed servant without even needing to go to him. He heals Peter's mother-in-law, her fever leaving her, her strength returning to her at just the touch of his hand. When evening came, he drove out evil spirits and healed all who were ill with just a word. The king in his kingdom. What kind of king? A powerful king. A king with authority. Authority over everything in his kingdom. What kind of king? A compassionate king. The leper knows Jesus can heal him. He doesn't know if he is willing to heal him. I am willing, Jesus says, be clean. He doesn't wait for the centurion to ask him for his servant. Shall I come and heal him, he says. He sees the need of Peter's mother-in-law and he responds. He sees the suffering of so many from the villages round about and he responds. A compassionate king. What kind of king? A king who uses his power only for the benefit of others. A king who commands with authority, but not in order to be served, but in order to serve. Is this the Jesus you know? I know it's the Jesus you know of, but is this the Jesus you know? Is this your Jesus, the Jesus who is in your life? Does your king offer you his power and his heart? Do you know his tender touch at your point of need? Do you listen to his voice as he speaks his word of powerful love into your need, into your hurt, your fear, your doubt? your regret every day. Do you know this Jesus? Will you remember him this week? And then secondly, who the king has come for? He's come for a leper, physically and spiritually unclean, unacceptable, lonely, who has not known the touch of another human being for so long. He's come for a foreigner, marginalised, not accepted, discriminated against, for a Roman centurion possessing all the power and prestige of Rome, but alienated, excluded, ignored by those among whom he lives. He's come for a woman, insignificant, unimportant, powerless in such a patriarchal society, weak and vulnerable physically and socially. He's come for those on the scrap heap of society, the despairing, the hopeless, Is this the Jesus you know, the Jesus who has come for you? The Jesus who sees your pain, your hurt, your loneliness, your disappointment, 
your emptiness, your hopelessness, your despair, your anger, your bitterness, your guilt. But a Jesus who doesn't turn from you, but who comes to you, reaches out his hand to you, offers you his touch, his presence, his love, just as you are. Is this the Jesus you know? Do you remember that he has come for you? Do you remember that if it was only you, in the whole world, it was only you who was aching for his lost presence without even knowing it? Do you remember that he would still have come only for you? Do you know that he accepts you just as you are? Do you seek him? and the sweetness of his presence in your life every day. Will you remember who he has come for this week? And then thirdly, what he has come to do for those for whom he has come. Matthew tells us in the last verse of our passage, verse 17, this all that he did was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. He came to take up and take away our illnesses, to carry away our diseases. Perhaps the greatest challenge to faith is that this does not seem to have happened. People we love continue to fall ill and die. Christians we know suffer as much as anyone else, die of disease, just like other people. Some of us know what it is to suffer, to struggle with long-term illness and pain, to face the reality of our own mortality, to grieve for those we have loved and love still, but who have gone. Perhaps the most natural question of all is why? Why has this happened? Why won't you heal? Why won't you take this away? All that he did was to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. These words come from Isaiah chapter 53, the chapter which speaks of the suffering servant of God, who poured out his soul unto death and bore the sin of many. They tell us that the way Jesus takes away our illnesses, carries away our diseases, is by dying to defeat the cause of all illness and disease, all pain and suffering, all grief and death. The cause of all these things is our rejection of God. The sin which blights the kingdom of this world and the lives of every subject of this kingdom. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus carried our iniquities to the cross, suffered our pain, died in our place for our rejection of God, taking into himself the cause of all our pain and sorrow, paying the price for it, and so dealing with it once and for all. But Isaiah continues. 
He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. The servant who died would be raised to new life. What Jesus was doing in the healings he performed while he was on earth was to show what his death and his resurrection would make possible for every member of his kingdom when it is established in its fullness. Jesus took up our infirmities and bore our diseases when he died for our sins on the cross. And when Jesus rose from the dead to new life, he showed what is to come. Life in place of death, wholeness in place of brokenness, health in place of sickness, peace in place of torment, joy in place of tears, fullness in place of emptiness, satisfaction in place of longing. His healings on earth were a foretaste, a glimpse of what his kingdom will be like for everyone who will wait for it, for anyone who will wait for it. When pain and sadness are our ever-present companions, will we remember what Jesus has done? Will we remember what his death has achieved? Will we remember what his resurrection has revealed? Will we remember what is to come? And lastly, how can we get what he has come to do for us? The leper knelt at Jesus' feet. He knew that, could, that Jesus could heal him, and so he asked him if he would heal him. The centurion, possessed of all the power of imperial Rome itself, came to Jesus and asked him for help. He saw that just as his words carried the authority of Caesar, so Jesus' words carried the authority of God himself. And so he came, not to Caesar, but to Jesus, asking for help. When Jesus heard what the centurion said, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Faith. Seeing who Jesus is. Knowing what Jesus can do. Abandoning all other ways of achieving what is needed. Asking him to do it trusting him for the outcome. Faith. Faith is the only way to get what Jesus has come to give us. Not our own solutions, not our own effort. Trust in God's solution. Trust in Jesus's effort for us. Not living to impress him in the hope that he will give us what we want. Remembering who he is. Remembering why he has come. Remembering for whom he has come. And asking him for help. Are you a subject of the kingdom of this king? If so, because you are still a subject of the kingdom of the world, you are in a dangerous place. Will you heed 
Jesus' warning in verses 11 and 12. Faith, not effort, is the passport admitting entry to the kingdom of the king. It's a kingdom open to anyone, to those from all over the world, as verse 11 says, from the east to the west. Just as God had promised Abraham it would be when he promised him that through one of his descendants, blessing would be brought to the whole world. With the passport of faith, of simple trust, anyone can be welcomed into the kingdom of life and wholeness. But without it, insisting on earning entry by our own efforts, by living a good enough life, by being a good enough Christian, observing God's ways, by doing all these things to gain merit, to establish our citizenship as subjects of the kingdom ourselves. Jesus warns us in verse 12, will be to be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. It is his glory to serve. As he said to Peter, when Peter would not let him wash his feet, if we will not let him serve us, we have no place in his kingdom. Jesus could not find this faith among those who claimed to be the subjects of the kingdom. Will we heed his warning? Many of us know these things. Will we remember them? Will we speak them to ourselves, remind ourselves of them every day? Will we listen to the words of God as he speaks them to us from the pages of the Bible to remind us, to help us not to forget? When it comes to actually living our lives, will we remember who Jesus is? Will we remember what Jesus can do? Will we remember who he came to do this for, will we remember? And so abandon God-forgetting ways by which we seek to solve our problems. Will we remember and ask him to do what we need him to do? Will we remember and trust him for the outcome? It is faith and faith alone that admits entry to the kingdom of the king. And faith lives, faith grows, faith is strengthened by remembering. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Help us to remember who you are, to seek you and to find you in every circumstance of our lives. Help us to share you with others. Amen.
come to the end of our service. As this nation and others move into the next stage of opening up after the pandemic, do pray for those in government, both here and around the world, as they take very difficult decisions in the coming weeks. And do pray for us as a church, as we honour one another through this difficult time. We will all have had very different experiences over the last 12 months. And some of those will be very painful indeed, and we will struggle to come to terms with them. Some will find it quite difficult to start doing things again. Others will be excited and raring to go. And we need to honour one another through these coming days. Keep making contact with others just to encourage them. And remember that Jesus is alive. He is with us always, whatever we are facing each day. Let's pray as we close. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.